first of all, an overview of the railroad, then the, more specifically the Poughkeepsie and Eastern Railroad on which the Pleasant Valley Station was, then the move from the station from Pleasant Valley to East West Road School and then to the fairgrounds. And we have a PowerPoint presentation on that. Anyway, believe it or not, in, in around 1890, it was 300, 300 miles of track in Dutchess County. Now that is, and there were nine different railroads, which is the pick which I'll, I'll describe them in a minute, nine different railroads, and over 70 stations, 300 miles of track, that's from here to Buffalo, 70 stations, I mean that sounds, I, I call it that here, mind boggling. It was 27 stations alone on the Duchess and Columbia, the state, the, the railroad that came through Millbrook. The, here, I'll just review which ones these are. These, these are, which are still in existence, this was the, the uh, Hudson, Hudson River Railroad, which is, uh, of course, became part of the New York Central, and then Metro North, and Amtrak. And then this was the Harlem River Railroad, which became the <coughs> Harlem, Harlem Division of the New York Central, <coughs> after it was taken over by Commodore Vanderbilt, and I think around 1970, uh, 1875. You had the, the, uh, the, the Rhinebeck in Columbia and, and, uh, and Connecticut, and this, this actually went up into uh, Columbia County over to Connecticut. The, the, the actually, actually, this is the P and E. This is the P and C, which was the Poughkeepsie and Connecticut, which went up through here and then over to Connecticut. The one we're talking about, the, the, the Poughkeepsie and, and Eastern. This is the, this is the one that the Pleasant Valley Railroad Station is on. And then this was the one that came. That came. This was the New York and New England that came over from Danbury over to Poughkeepsie. And then, the, then the one that. It runs through Millbrook, ran through Millbrook, is the Duchess in Columbia, which started down here at Fishkill Landing and went up to Millbrook, up to Pine Plains and over. But if that's not mind-boggling, I don't know what is. <laughs> the first, the first <laughs> train that ever to come to Duchess County came, believe it or not, to Dover in 1848. Now, this is 1848, it's quite a ways before the opening of the uh, the Duchess of Columbia in 1871, and the, the Poughkeepsie and Eastern in 1871. Most of these, most of these railroads ended up having financial problems and went through many different ownerships and so on. Like I say, the only ones existing now are the two main lines here. This one only goes to Los City, as you know now. It used to go to Chatham. So, <coughs> Uh, the an interesting thing is that one of the things that trains that the trains allowed people to do is that it allowed kids who had uh, eighth grade educations in one room schoolhouses to get to places of higher education. And those three main places were Millbrook next door, Rhinebeck, and Poughkeepsie. So, so back in the in the early 18, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, kids would come via the train from in, in all these stations on, that were on the Duchess and Columbia to Millbrook to that high school right in the backyard here. And uh, otherwise, they did not have any higher education. Uh, my wife has found some, uh, what was a, they used to have, and she has it over there, you can look at it after the meeting, uh, little monthly passes for students actually student passes that you can use on a train to get to the to schools. Um, the railroads, and one of the, one of the things that's, that's very misunderstood about railroads is that, that the, the reason that railroads were popular and cars did not get off to a real good start is because of the roads. It wasn't the fact you didn't have wheels, obviously had wheels, trains had wheels. The, uh, the technology was there for all the making cars and trucks or whatever, but it was the roads and the, in, in the spring with the mud, and they didn't have a way to plow the snow. Years ago, they had much more snow than they had today. So that was a very 
misunderstood thing was the roads is why you didn't get cars until earlier, not because of anything else. It's an interesting thing. One of the, one of the other <coughs> very important things is about the development of the railroads is that it was, it was we, have, we have been kind of led to believe that agriculture was the main reason for the development of the internal, internal uh, railroad system in Dutchess County. That was not the case. The, 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 the reason that these trains, this, this trackage was developed was to get coal from Pennsylvania to the manufacturers in New England and be able to take manufactured goods back. So, so again, here we had the two north and south lines to the New York Central. So they, they needed a way to go from from east from New England over here down to down to in this case Fishkill Landing, where cars from the Erie Railroad, which is the Hudson River, which was across the river. The cars were ferried across the river and then hooked onto the trains and came up through Melbourne and so on over to New England. And all of the money, when they tried to raise money, all these they had town meetings like this, and they would come and they would say, most of you were farmers at that time, and they would say, well, you we put the railroad through and we'll be able to get your milk through town, you'll be able to get stuff in, other other. Uh, other supplies and so on, which, which was true. But that wasn't the main thing. I mean, this was very misleading when they started out. Like I said, as far as agricultural products, milk was the main thing. It was a perishable uh, item. New York City was still the, the biggest market for milk, and uh, how are you going to get it? It's perishable. So uh, they could go down to the river put it on a boat and go south, so that takes like two days. And in the winter time, what, the river was frozen. You couldn't, get, you couldn't go anywhere in the river. So this made the milk hauling was the prime product, agricultural product that was shipped. Like I said before, outlandish, many outlandish claims were made to investors about economic growth. And matter of fact, in the case of the Kipsey and Eastern Railroad, where the Pleasant Valley Station is, the Isaac Platt, who was the publisher of the of the uh, Kipsey, uh, what was the Kipsey Journal and Kipsey yeah. Register or whatever it was back in the 1800s, he he took it upon himself to try to push the taxpayers of Poughkeepsie to uh, fund this railroad, and he made, like I say, outlandish claims of. Uh, that your land is going to be worth ten times as much, you, the, the uh, population is going to explode. I mean, it's like finding gold on your property. And truly, it was out, outlandish. And, and, it, and it turned out that really this whole system was a folly. And I looked up what folly meant. It means tragically foolish action. When, uh, I looked in the dictionary, I knew the word folly, and I said, what does that really mean? That's what it means. And, and obviously, you look at this, does it really, do you really think you need three railroads going through Stanfordville? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, to look back, and that's why this, this is so important. And people look at this up at the fairgrounds, they say, are you sure this is right? I said, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's how ridiculous it was. It was one entrepreneur after the, you know, against another, like they are the coal fracking or the oil fracking industry today, trying to, to do that. Having said all that, <laughs> within all the parameters of this, it was George Hunter Brown, the founder of Millbrook, who had the greatest impact on the railroads in Dutchess County. I'm, I'm going to say this to you as a group. I don't know if you ever did a if you ever had a meeting or, or a presentation on George Hunter Brown, or even you know who George Hunter Brown oh, is, no, yes, but, but yeah, most of you do, I'm, I'm going to yeah. tell you the truth. I've been here all my life, and I didn't know who George Hunter Brown was until one day I was at a funeral in the Federated Church. I was standing next to a post and looking around, and here's a, here's a uh, plaque on this. This church was, you know, in part funded by George Hunter Brown. And all these railroad books that you read, he is credited with so much because he was a dynamic, charismatic, 
person, and he did. He built this Duchess of Columbia on his own. I mean, he went to the town meetings and got money and got money, but he was there in the right in the pits and worked on this uh, feverishly. And and, re and and realistically, railroads historians say that if it wasn't for all these other railroads popping up, this probably would have still been in existence. It would have made economic sense. But uh, I thought I thought that was just absolutely amazing. George Hunter Brown was a supervisor of the town of Washington. In, 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 interesting, he uh, came here in uh, 1863, and he left in, in 1874. He was only here for 12 years. I mean, and to do all that stuff, I mean, he, he, he needs a, a statue downtown here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the panic, the panic, there was a panic, a, a financial panic in 1873, which had terrible implications for the railroads. Uh, George Hunter Brown himself suffered uh, his personal financial setbacks, and uh, the, the whole railroad industry suffered many setbacks during that time. But anyway, the, the, they struggled, struggled along, and uh, in, in both of the, most of the rails, the, the, this, the Duchess and Columbia, the P and E railroad tracks were torn up in 1938, and and sadly to say, the steel that was in those rails, and you know where they went, Japan, and we got it sent oh, back to us in World War II. That was one of the greatest terrible things that happened. And interestingly enough, I do get a magazine called Trains Magazine, and today, the Western railroads, I mean the Union Pacific, the Southern Pacific Railroad still get rails from Japan. They're made in Japan in 440 foot lengths. They have a boat just to, just to go back and forth from uh, near Los Angeles back to Japan with, with rail. So we're still they're still sending it back. At least it's it's not in the form of guns. So that's a, that was my presentation on that part. Now. More specifically, I better speed it up. Right? More specifically to the, because uh, the end of it's so great, the movement. The, the, hey, 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 Dick. The, the, I think we have a question here. I just want to know, if, were there cattle on those on those trains? Were they? Oh, sure. Okay, it's not okay. just taking cattle down to the city for slaughter and they, meat packing center. Sure, all cattle, most yeah, cattle were moved by train. Sure. At that time. Oh yeah. Oh, the cattle came to Millbrook on train. Horses, Thorndale, uh, up until the early 30s, Thorndale still sent their horses down south for the for the for the winter, and they loaded them on where the golf course is, right across from where Hugh Collins' house is. That's where they <coughs> tracked for there, up in, up into the late 30s. Yes, yes, your question. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, the the the, Kips, the uh, uh, Kips and Eastern Railroad was chartered in 1866 and was actually built in 1870 to 1872. The train station opened in uh, 1871. As most as I said before, they had financial distress on all these railroads, and in particular the and in particular the. the Gibson Eastern Railroad when it started in 1873, actually full operation. In 1874, it was bankrupt. It was became the Poughkeepsie, Hartford, and Austin Railroad. After they they went bankrupt, it was the New York and Massachusetts Railroad. Then it went back to the Poughkeepsie and Eastern Railroad. Then it became the Central New England Railroad, which did become part of the New Haven Railroad, which you all recognize as a as a very substantial. Railroad, and that all the tracks there were abandoned in 1838. The P and E and Poughkeepsie Eastern were, was financed primarily by taxpayers from Poughkeepsie. Taxpayers of Poughkeepsie. A lot of these others, like the, the Duchess of Columbia, was financed by farmers, mostly by farmers and towns. I'm sure George Hunter Brown was right here near us, getting money from different things. Um, on the P and E. Believe it or not, there was a lot of social travel. 
And you say, what is social travel? Well, social travel was people from Poughkeepsie would come to Pleasant Valley, people from New York would come up on a train to Poughkeepsie and then go out to Pleasant Valley, and, and it was like a, a, a resort town. Uh, there was three hotels in, in Pleasant Valley. One is still there, the Roadhouse, right there. Who's asking me about the, right by the corner there? Talbots, which is gone, and I don't know where the other one was. But they would they would come there, and then farmers also they they opened their houses for boarders. When the train would come to town, the the farmer would go over with a horse and wagon, get the person, and and they would stay in the farmer's house, and the, I don't know how much they would get for a week or a day, maybe eight or six or eight dollars a week. But it was a very important source of, of income to the the farm the community. Upton Lake, you know where Upton Lake is over by Clinton Corners, they had a park there, Upton Park. And that they, they encouraged people from come to Poughkeepsie and to have fun there. They had swim in the lake, they had amusement parks, they had so on and so forth. They put out these elaborate brochures as uh, to entice people to come. Uh, here's the fact that on Labor Day in, in Labor, Labor Day in 1873, 427 people boarded the train to <coughs> Pleasant Valley to go to Poughkeepsie. <coughs> now, just the opposite of what I just said. They said, you know, what are you talking about? You just said they came from Poughkeepsie to there. Well, this was happened to be Labor Day Parade in Poughkeepsie. So they had a big parade. There's 427 people got on that Pleasant Valley. I thought that's, I mean, that's quite, a, it's mind-boggling. It really is. Another thing that uh, I didn't realize, and uh, that ice was a very important product for farmers. The railroads had to have ice when they came out refrigerated cars, and just had to have ice to take to, to New York to put in the old, uh, you know, the old ice boxes. We put the ice in the top. They had to get it from somewhere. So the ice business was very, very important and very lucrative part of farming because they didn't have other products to sell, I mean other than milk, but farmers who had hay or other types of corn or other types of products, they, they, they a great part of their income came from ice. That's, I find that amazing. We found an old ice saw uh, and we have it over at the train station in the, in our, in our, in right there. Um, the, like I say, the Gipsy, the uh, Pleasant Valley Station opened in 1871 with mail service, then mail service, and then the telegraph was came there in 1873. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, it was a hub of activities. It became the social. It was like John Cady's store used to be, the hub of activities. The railroad station was in court. Had a telegraph. Had a tele. Later, probably the first telephone was there. Mail service, you know, you see the guys sitting around the, the um, stoves and so on in the wintertime. You can just envision it. It's, 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 it's amazing. And, uh, in, in 1912, there were 10 days, of, 10 trains a day going through, uh, going through Pleasant Valley. In 1873, this is a this is came out one of the books I have. In 1873, from delivered from the Pleasant Valley Station, 1,269 pounds of animal products. Now that's not milk. I'm not sure if meat, whatever animal products are. 268 pounds of vegetables. 33,980 pounds of agricultural products which would be like apples and stuff like that. Apples, believe it or not, apples were a big, a big item. Right, Harry? I know you and I talked about yeah. apples. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then 3,770 pounds of factory products, and that would have been like wool from the wool mill and so on, different little things like that. A typical train that would have been uh, on the at railroad in p and &E and come through Millbrook, uh, consisted of a of an engine, of course, a baggage car, and two two coaches. And the typical uh, labor makeup of that train would have been an engineer, fireman who shoveled the coal or wood into the engine, or to make steam, a brakeman, 
brake, which is a brake, runs the brakes, and a conductor who runs the whole train, and possibly a baggage man, believe it or not, that went ahead these trains coming up to Pleasant Valley with New Yorkers on them for the so and I'm and up to here too. Uh, I mean people came from New York, you know, the Flaglers through the Flaglers and so on and so forth, and they probably had their baggage in there. One one sidelight I just thought of I don't have it on my list. Dietrich's estate used to import horse manure from Manhattan. To their farm up up the road, and, and they used to hook the cars on the end of these passenger trains with these with these, these fancy people like the Flaglers and so on and so forth. And, and, the, and the smell got a little overwhelming, and they they had to have a, a, a meeting and and stop the railroad from pulling the cars full of horsemen. Of course, the horsemen were came from all the horses in New York, they didn't have cars. Isn't that astounding? <laughs> <laughs> in 1874, the, the income on the Peony Railroad was as follows. Iron ore, calling iron ore, $87,000. Milk, $58,000. Hay, Thirty-two thousand, and passengers forty-one thousand. So there's probably some other little stuff in there, but generally that, that totals up to two hundred eighteen thousand dollars for the entire railroad in the, that, about eighteen seventy-four. And, the, and my last thing here, as they said, the P and E railroad, P and E people called it poor and exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Poor and exhausted. All right, now we're going to get into the, how, how am I doing on time? Way over, right? <laughs> no, you never heard anything like this, so this, <laughs> anyway, this is, a, this is the story about the station itself, which I came to talk about. The move, the move from Pleasant Valley to West Road School. And then it moved from West Road School to Rhinebeck. So this, this one covers the, 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 the movement from, uh, from the first move. The, the station was moved three times. Three. How many buildings did it move three times? The station was closed in 1937, and it was, it was located, according to Matt Cady, where, you know where CBS um, yes, Pharmacy is? He said that the station was about where the pharmacy section of CVS was. So if you can envision the CVS store in the back, on the right, the, 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 the station. The station was 20 by 40, exactly 20 by 40. In the early 40s, it was purchased by people called Miles and Marion Carroll. They purchased the station and the land where it was there, and they converted it to a residence without plumbing, and they rented it out for many years. In 1960, Rene Williams, a lot of you remember the Ford garage there, Rene Williams, who owned the Ford garage, purchased the station and the land from uh, Carroll, and he used it for storage. But he maintained it, he painted it, he put a new roof on it, and so on and so forth. He, he used it for storing oil and mufflers and everything else. In 1986, the new owner, purchased the Ford garage, he announced that he was enlarging his property and that the train station was in the way and he didn't want any, he wanted it out of there. He was going to demolish it. At that, so very, this, is where, this is where it really starts an important part of this whole thing. The town historian, Olive Doty, does anybody recognize that name, Olive Doty? Okay, <coughs> is she still alive by any chance? I, I, I really don't know. I, I, don't imagine, I don't imagine she can be, but she was a, obviously a dynamo in the Pleasant Valley. She, she heard about this and she talked, she's a town historian, and she came to talk to the local historical society, her counterpart down in Pleasant Valley. This was in 1986. 
and they were successful in forming an action committee that raised ten thousand dollars, and they they then turned they they turned the they they bought it as a historical society, and as soon as they owned it, they turned it over to the town, gave it to the town of Pleasant Valley. At this point, the town of Pleasant Valley owns it. It's still where CVS Pharmacy is. They then moved it, uh, moved it in its, in, together in, as one piece to what they call Milestone Plaza, which is that little, if you go down, turn by CVS and you go past CVS, there's a driveway in there. It was a, a little uh, shopping center that thrived for a little while. There was a pizza place back in there. And uh, it was there for, for a while. Shortly after that, so here's the here's the town. So now it moved once. Town of Pleasant Valley owns it. Shortly after that, Joseph Diaquani, who was the principal of the West Road School, you all know where the West Road School is. You go up West Road, and there's a half a mile up the road. It's on the left there. He came up with the idea of moving the station from Milestone Plaza to the school, and the school could be used for classrooms and museum, and that sounded good. So that, everybody liked that idea. That would be a logical place for it. It wasn't going to last very long down in Millstone Plaza. So, so that came, so they started doing that. So on June 14th, June 14th in, in 1989, it was moved. Uh, moved from Milestone Plaza to the West Road <laughs> School. And it, it's, it was there until recently. And the, interestingly enough, the Nicholas Brothers from Hopewood Junction moved the, moved the station up there. And, and, and probably none of you know that the nursery school that was at Bennett College, it was up by the golf course, uh, now down by the monument, you know, Rice knows that, so many people know that, but Nicholas Brothers moved that in its entirety down there, and I was worked on that project. I had a big B9 bulldozer, and if you move a building, you, you gotta, you gotta have a steady grade, you can't go like this, so, so I had a big B9 bulldozer and made the road down past Exmoor, down through the field, down near Carroll Hall, around to where it was today, so worked with Nicholas Brothers. They're the ones that uh, moved to here. Um, the, uh, and the very, I think it's very important to notice that the Dyson family was the one that made this possible. Uh, the, the town collected money to get, to, to get the first money to do it. But the Dyson family uh, uh, got, the, got together and they, they're the ones that financed this move and saved the Pleasant Valley train station. And Rob Dyson uh, was a friend of all of ours. Uh, he, he, he considers the railroad station like his personal property. <laughs> and you'll find out why in a minute. Okay, so, so now we have the, now we have the railroad station moved twice from CVS parking lot, from CVS pharmacy area to Milestone Plaza and Milestone Plaza to uh, the school. Now, here comes the more the meat of the uh, move to Dutchess County Fair. All right, in about 2008, Warren Wigston, who many of you might know, I know Harry knows him well, other people know. Warren Wigston was a, a long time, Wigston Road is still there, long time residence of, of Pleasant Valley, and he was on the board of directors for a long, long, long time. And he, he is deceased now. But uh, he, he died last it was last March, wasn't it, Harry? Yeah, I think it was just a year ago. Yeah. So he uh, he got the idea that he, along with a fellow called Dieter Friedrichsen, who is a railroad historian, who lives over in Salt Point, who's written some books on railroads, they got the idea to, I think it was Warren's idea, and then he went to Dieter, Dieter and he got the thing going, the idea of moving it to the fairgrounds. And to, and, and the reason for that is that we had been contemplating a historic village up at the train state, up at the uh, fairgrounds. And previous to that, we had moved the uh, schoolhouse from Pine Plains to the, to the fairgrounds. 
So Warren, uh, he, uh, <coughs> he, uh, he developed that idea. He started talking about it a little bit around the fair and so on. And that's when I got involved. What Warren is, was aging. He, he was 85 at the time. He, and he, uh, he spent a lot of time in Florida. And he, he couldn't be an active, uh, actively uh, involved with this. So he came to me. And he, Warren and I have been very close over the years with our farming experiences and so on and so forth. <coughs> and, oh, where's that water? Um, so, so I said, okay, I'll, <coughs> I'll help you with it. I'll see what I can do. I'll be a part of a committee. So a committee of the board was of the door directors. I'm on the board director of the fair, along with Warren. Uh, we formed a committee of Warren, Mark Germond, who I think probably a lot of you know, he's the head of the historical building up at the fairgrounds, a big building. Lucky Coon from uh, uh, Red Hook, he has a construction business. A lot of people, you, you probably don't know Lucky. Bob Beckman, who was very instrumental in this, he owns Matt's Auto Body over in Salt Point, who was just new on the board at the time, and myself. And then, as, the, as things developed, Ingrid Kulik was part of the committee, and she was in fundraising and different things, uh, peripheral things, and so on and so forth. And my wife, Lovey, there, she became part of the committee. So at that time, the idea was presented to the, to the Pleasant Valley Town and the Arlington School Board, and it was a question on who owned the property. Uh, they guess there was there was no real deed to it, you know. It was not like you transfer a property. Here's here, take this. It's like this easel here. I'll give price. I'll give you this. You know, I'm not, there's no papers involved. Here, it's yours. But it wasn't quite clear who owned it. Uh, it was the intent that the that the town owned it because before when I said that, that Mrs. Um, <coughs> Paul Doty had formed this committee to give it to the town. Now, as soon as, like, like anything else, and Milbrook is the same way, as soon as you come up with some idea, people can become opposed to it, right? It can, be, it can be apple pie and motherhood or whatever, the nicest thing in the world it could be, it's going to be trouble. So, so, so that, that, that was the case. So, so there was a, I don't to mention any names, there was a committee of about 40 people down in Pleasant Valley who became opposed to moving this thing. Now remember, at this time, this, this, this was not used like Mr. D'Arquani had intention. The, the, there was no running water in the place, so the teachers did not want to take their kids out there. It probably was against the law to put them in a building where there was no running water. Then it started to get vandalized, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it was a need to speed this thing up. So, but anyway, they had, and I stayed away from these meetings. They said, come, please come down to Pleasant Valley and talk about the train station. I said, no, I'm from Millbrook. You get somebody from Pleasant Valley to, to talk to them about it, not me. So, I was smart enough to do that. <laughs> so, anyway, they sorted it all out, hashed it all out. And, and the, the, this, is, this is where it gets really interesting. And it shows you what people, it's an, it, it applies to this meeting right here, because it shows you what people can do. Two very influential people wrote letters in 2009. One being Rudy Zaki, and I don't know if you know who Rudy Zaki is. Uh, you, do any of you remember Rudy's Market down there on oh, yeah. next to Clayton Hayes Garage? No. Well, his last name was Z Zaki, and he wrote, he after it was moved to the, uh, the uh, uh, West Road School, he volunteered at least a thousand hours and, and got other people to help him to, um, um, to, 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 re to refurbish the thing. When he first got it, then it got vandalized, he moved to Florida. And Olive Doty, the person that had been talking about this town historian. So, the, the, I'm going to read you these letters. This is very important because it, it applies to you as a group. If you have some issue in Millbrook or something, 
you, you got to get involved. And one person's letter can mean a lot. These two people were very important. And I, and I, did. I hope I'm not running out of time here. We're coming down the home stretch. This is very important. <laughs> this is the actual. This is the actual letter. This is this is an old piece of paper that she had. This is the little letter. It's not a copy. We're going to hang this up in the train station. It doesn't say to who. It just this is, again. This is for the town board and for the school. This is in um, combat. The movement for the, of these 40 people who wanted to save it. And those people wanted to move it too. They wanted to move it up to Reddell Park. And I don't know if you know where Reddell Park is. That's too right. You go up the hill from the West Route School where it meets Salt Point Turnpike. It's like a side hill. They wanted to move it up there, which is, you know, the, the topography of the land would be not conducive to that. So this is it. There's a couple of words that are a little bit funny here. I have been asked for my opinion concerning allowing the railroad station that now stands on the grounds of the West Road School to be moved to the fairgrounds in Rhinebeck. I am in favor of such a move. See, that was, that's set in volumes right there. I am in favor of such a move. The original thought in moving it there was using it as an extra classroom by the school district. It hasn't happened. <laughs> Nor has the school district been gracious in allowing the Pleasant Valley Historical Society to use it. <laughs> it just stands there. By being part of the history village at the history it should be historical history village at the fairgrounds, it will justify all the work that Rudy Zaki put in with along with many others to keep it looking like it does a train station to the c and &E Railroad. Should be the &E. That ran through the hamlet of Pleasant Valley, signed Olive Doty. Now, now this one, here's from Rudy Zaki, here's from this other fellow that did the thousand hours worth of stuff. This is written to, to Warren Wakeston, who passed it on to them. This is in 2009. I am delighted to hear that the Dutchess County Ag Society is interested in moving the Pleasant Valley train station to the grounds of the fair. It is hard to believe that it has been 20 years ago that I worked for two and a half years restoring the building. <laughs> Joe Diaquani has great ideas for its use and it is disappointing that no one has found a use for it all this time. Fair, uh, placing it along with the other historical buildings at the fairgrounds is a wonderful idea it is a community treasure, and it will help preserve it for future generations. Sincerely, Rudy Zaki. P.S. Pleasant Valley Historical Society has pictures and movie, movies of the relocation. So I thought that was, I, that, that says an awful lot right there. So okay, so then the, they, after that, the, the, the town, the, the, we made more overtures to try to get this, this uh, building. So I talked to Frank Pepe, talked to, I went down and visited the people down to school, and they said, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we don't know, we'll, uh, we'll think about it, we'll talk about it, so on. And so it, it ended up that the, uh, they didn't know who owned it, and they, they School, finally a lawyer got involved and they said, school owns it, not Pleasant Valley owns it. The school would not release it until the town board okayed it, recommended it. They, just, they had no jurisdiction, but they said, we want the town of Pleasant Valley to say, yeah, okay, do it. So they, here's a letter, this is another letter from you're right. Um, the town clerk of Pleasant Valley, this is dated March 15th, 2010. The president of the Arlington School District, dear members of the Arlington Central School District, a regular, me regular town board meeting was held Wednesday, March 10th, 2010. The Pleasant Valley town board unanimously voted to adopt the proposed resolution recommending, recommending that the Pleasant Valley train station be relocated to the Dutchess County Fairgrounds, that the conveyance and the conveyance 
be conditioned on recognition of the historical significance of the railroad station and that for, forever by the preservation of the name of the building as the Pleasant Valley Railroad Station. So that's the only thing they cared about, which obviously we do anyway, you know, and, and I made sure that that was done and there is a sign up there, Pleasant Valley Railroad Station. Thank you for, for your matter, Deborah Borkman, town clerk. So, so that paved the way. So then, so the school board, after they heard that, then, then we did. So, okay. So then, it's a done deal, ready, ready to go, right? Ready to move the thing. No? <laughs> Not, like I say, nothing's easy. So, so it's ours, a dollar, we paid them a dollar. We, got a, we did get some sort of a written, uh, written agreement and so on and so forth. So we're ready to move it. So Bucky Kuhn and I, representing the board of directors, go down to the uh, village of Rhinebeck to get a building permit. We got, even though it's fairgrounds, we got a building permit. Oh, I don't know if should we go, but it's, it's cute. It says, uh, this is addressed, this is on October 20th, 2011. Bucky Kuhn and Dick Whalen, Dutchess County Yank Society. Gentlemen, today you came to my office and asked what has to be done at this time to move the Pleasant Valley train station to the fairgrounds and erect it near the schoolhouse. <laughs> I pointed out to you that the village of Rhinebeck has determined that the use of the fairgrounds is a non-conforming use <laughs> and, that, and that the allowable use group chart in the village zoning law does not permit in any fashion fair type uses. <laughs> Thus, the uses at the fairgrounds are non-conforming uses. Any of you can Allison, you're a lot smarter than can you understand that? <laughs> That, that would mean all buildings there are, are it's a, wouldn't that mean that all buildings at the fair are in violation? Yeah. <laughs> I'll explain that. Thus, thus, the uses at the okay, non-conforming uses defined in the zoning law as any, uh, any use lawfully existing prior to an at the at the time of adoption of or amendment of this chapter or any preceding zoning law or ordinance which which use is not permitted or does not conform with the permitted use provisions in this chapter for the district of where it's located. This guy's <laughs> not a lawyer, he's just a fine lawyer. <laughs> Section 120B, 51B of the zoning law states that a non-conforming use shall not be enlarged or extended beyond the area occupied by such use at the time of the adoption of the law and that a non-conforming use may not increase the intensity by increasing the number of people working at the business. <laughs> Okay, I'm almost done. Section 2151 states that a non-conforming use may not be moved in part or in any to any other portion of the lot occupied by such a non-conforming use. Now the next one is the real problem. As a consequence to the above, <laughs> the train station cannot be located at the fair as it will violate section 120 B1 B I think you should meet with the mayor and the village board to resolve this. <laughs> so anyway, I got in my notes that that's gibberish. Okay. What, what uh, Jim picked up on was at the time they were going to rezone. There was some there was some problems in a relationship between several individuals in the town within the town board. With some some little problem between the fair and the 
town. But what really precipitated this is when Chelsea Clinton got married over there. Oh. And the town was clogged with people and so on and so forth. And that, that, that created a big backlash, which, which is still today. The, the, the town of the village of Rhinebeck was trying to enact legislation that would mandate you getting a permit for any assemblage of people over 500 people for which you would pay $500. Oh my so in the case of the fair, and none of, none of most other people aren't going to have 500 people, even at a big wedding, you probably wouldn't have 500 people. But anyway, at the fair, you have several things that get more than 500 people. So every time you want to have a, have a, a beer bacon and a bus over there, you get 1,500 people, you have to go down to the village, get a permit, they'd have to talk about it, give you a thing and pay them $500. So that got, matter of fact, that got busted up at the state level. I think Harry Baldwin knows about that, that the state had stepped in. Because there was other towns in the state that were trying to do other things to their fairgrounds. They had to step up and say, who's got priority here, you know? So anyway, that was kind of the, kind of the, the uh, situation there. I want to, I want to, I want to point out this right here. Is we're kind of mixing the fair with the trains, and this is this is the Duchess and Columbia Railroad. Our railroad came from Millbrook. Now this, I don't know if you can read it. it says a special train will run to the Dutchess County Fair at Washington Hollow, September 14, 1869. Yeah. So, the, so here. The, the, the fairgrounds were, uh, here's, here's, here's the old brother, and here's the fairgrounds down there. Yeah, yeah. So that's another mind-boggling, in my opinion, another mind-boggling thing. If you lived in, in Burbank, you'd go, to get to the Dutchess County Fair, you'd come to Millbrook on the train and get, and, and be escorted down to, down to, uh, Washington Hollow by the, by the train. I mean, that's, it's unbelievable. Tell them where the tag mountains were, Jay, in Washington. Oh, oh right where the where, where the Chilcate headquarters <laughs> are. That whole area in the <laughs> That's that's to be another topic. Don't not don't look at me. Again, you can look at this afterward. This is the, this was the these were the yeah. The railroad meant a lot of money. No. So wait a minute. Did the railroad make a lot of money selling masks to the commuters that came up from New York that had been suffering the uh, horse species? Uh, well, they did for a while until they, the, the people stopped the horse species from going on the train. So, yes and no. Well, I guess that answers that question. But isn't that interesting, Dietrich? This is the, 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 uh, the stations on the Poughkeepsie and Eastern Railroad. Well, hey, after, after we break up, please come up and look at that. All right, now, just want to talk about the fair. Uh, the fair, we're talking about Washington Hollow. The, the fair started in 1842 in Washington Hollow. In 1843, it went to Poughkeepsie. It was in Poughkeepsie. 1844, it was back at, Pleasant, back at Washington Hollow until 1887. And from 1888 until 1918, it was in Poughkeepsie. 1919, you moved to Rhinebeck. Rhinebeck ever since. Okay, we're ready for the ready for the uh, slides. Now this is the actual moving of the station. And these 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 presentations were made by Ingrid pictures by Ingrid Kuhl, like the lady that I was talking about. Um, this 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 is a um, sketch of a of a of what we had envisioned there. The, most of you are familiar with fairgrounds, I'm sure of that. But anyway, years ago we had moved this, this particular building over here, which is the schoolhouse, which was up on uh, Mount Ross, up there in, in Pine Plains. We moved that. Harry, do you remember when that was? That was 20 years ago, right? No. I don't think it was that much. Oh, that was much. 15 years ago. Yeah. That was over 10. I would say it is. Yeah, it was at least, it was, I bet it was 15. Anyway, so this, this was there. This was a, a historical 
building down here. That would be great. The track is over here. So we're, this is where we envisioned putting the train station right here. And this is how we envisioned it looking uh, before we moved it. And in doing so, we made a pass. This, this path is not here. So we made this pass so you could walk down the, this way down the hill and into the back of the historical uh, building down there. Which made the, I think made a dramatic uh, uh, impact on the, on the uh, flow of traffic and uh, fare gains. This, right, this little building right here, we didn't talk about the outhouse. Yes, there is an outhouse. We do have it in our possession, and we're going to try to get it uh, situated this year. And uh, so that will be right, As it looks right there, what, what that was going to be, we were going to, our electrics, our electric comes out of the back of this building, and we were going to have that as a main junction box for our, for our, our wiring and so on. We never did that. Okay. Um, Okay, so the, some of these things that I said before, the, the Duchess County Ag Society, this, that's another thing I wanted to tell you. A lot of people think that the, the Duchess, called Duchess County Ag Society, the Duchess County Fair, has something to do with Duchess County and the fact that they fund us or anything else. We, we get no money at all from Duchess County uh, government. Uh, the 4-H does get some, which is a very important part of our fair. We are a 501c3 status now. We just named that in, like I said, in 2013. We consist of an 80-member organization, board of 16 board members, uh, members and associate members. Uh, so uh, our, our main focus, our, our mandate is uh, focus on agriculture, Horticulture, education, historic preservation, maintenance, and safe family, so on and so forth. Um, everybody, some people say, well, it's a big carnival. Well, it, the Duchess County Fair is a big event. It's a big, it's a big business, really, what it is. And you have to, with all the the uh, uh, buildings and the infrastructure that we have there, we have five or six, seven full-time employees all year long takes a lot of money. So you've got to get the money that comes with the carnival and so on and so forth. But, and, and so uh, we try to keep it, we try to keep a good uh, balance of the, of the uh, activities there to keep that in mind. And when people say, well, it's a big carnival, I don't want to go, you know, that's really not true. Okay. Uh, I say, same vision of our society, actively engaged in the pursuit of act, promotion of rural and agricultural heritage, backyard farms, and so on and so forth. We are trying to, right now, with all the um, artisanal type of things, uh, people making honey and bread and all the different things in between, cheese, and so on and so forth, we're trying to feature that and incorporate them into different things that we're doing right now. Because it is, a, it is true that our agricultural some parts of it, mainly the dairy industry, is, is declined in Dutchess County. That's no secret. And I'll tell you a fact, and Dave Teeter told me this. Dave Teeter was a longtime uh, chairman of the uh, uh, Extension Service. In about 1970, there was 225 dairy farms in Dutchess County. Today, there's 17. There's more horses, and I have nothing against horses. <laughs> there's more horses in Dutchess County today then there is. Yeah. Okay. All right, there's a picture of the train station as it was originally in Pleasant Valley. <laughs> it's brick, is that right? What? It's made of brick. No, oh, wood. Wood. It's wood. Uh -huh. no, it's all wood. I'm sure that and other stations were like it. And again, I want to comment on that too. When we, when we put that at, at Rhinebeck, Yes, this is the Pleasant Valley train station. Yes, we're calling it the Pleasant Valley train station. But we're also saying it was typical of all these other 70 or 80 railroad uh, uh, train stations in the county. And all of them were held of activity in the town. They all had the telegraph. They, they, all, they all they served that same purpose. So it's typical of, of, the, uh, of the railroad industry at the time. And there was other stations that were like that. There was probably there were their posts and beam buildings, and they were probably brought in by the rail. Oh, sure. Okay. When was this built originally? 1871.
Can you can you say which way it's situated there? What like um, on location? I, so I don't. I, I, I can't tell you. It's very confusing um, because you, you can envision where CVS was, and the tracks came over by Masson's store, across you know, with the red building, across the street. So it would be. I don't know. The tracks go in front of Masson's, or the tracks I think went in back of Masson's, and across the road, and then through where CVS was, and I think curved All right. This is this is really how it looked. At, uh, up at the school uh, and, and so on and so forth. This, I think, I took that picture maybe. And it, like I say, it started to get vandalized, and we, uh, as a fair, even prior to us owning it officially, we went down, we meaning the guys at the fair, went down with plywood and boarded up the buildings to try to prevent any further damage. Okay. All right, Museum Village. Uh, we're trying to hope to fill the vision of the Hudson Valley Historic Landmarks by bringing buildings that would be lost and displays artifacts to the fairgrounds that are preserved to see uh, by over 500,000 visitors annually. Uh, that's a very lofty number there. But with all the with all the, the fair and the the, the uh, Woolen Sheep Fest, Woolen festival and the other uh, the motorcycle show and other things there is a lot of people who go through there we estimated and, and I want to say now I, I'm very thankful to uh, the people down at the, the uh, we worked with the people down at the Hopeful Junction Railroad Station Bernie Rudberg and <coughs> Rich uh, Wag uh, who's a Taylor we're <laughs> talking to John Taylor and so on and so forth who were very uh, we went down there, Judy and I, and, and Bucky Cool went down there a couple of times, and we talked to them. They were very helpful in encouraging us to do it. They also helped us during fair week because they sent people up that, would, that um, were uh, tour guides, so to speak. There's a lot of valuable things in there, so we, we had to have tour. So I want to state that we were thankful to them. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we covered that. That's our committee. Yeah. Uh, site. Site there we go. Site group. Okay, so we're up to 2014. And uh, finally, they're hoping they get the... Uh, well, we did. they did get the zoning issue resolved. Uh, we, got, we had to give and take a little bit. We, we, Gave up a little land over. There's a track is over here. There's a horse ring. Yeah. We had to make a buffer zone over there. That we're not going to build anything over there, and that's just fine with us. We got enough land anyway. So anyway, so so uh, in 2014, they started building the foundation, and it's a slab. You can see we built down the foundation. We poured the poured the foundation, put uh, styrofoam uh, insulation in there. And of course, there's the schoolhouse, which is well here. There, yeah, you can see it right next door here. So this is right close to that. There's that walk I was talking about that goes down through here. So. Again, this building is 20 by 40. Cool. Okay. All right. Here's here's where we started to take it apart. Uh, the people that worked on it were Mitch and Keith Wager, who are uh, have a business over in uh, Wager Construction over in Salt Point, and they were the they were the guys, we put the machinery in, we got so on and so forth. Had to put a fence around it, of course, for safety. And this, like I say, Bob Beckman, who, like I say, he was on the board, who fellow that owns Matt's auto body, he took a real interest in this thing, and he became kind of the everyday, he would go and see how the guys were doing. Okay. And we're here, we hired, we rented trucks, we rented two or three trucks like that, and we took it all apart and saved as much as we could, but, you know, it's like the roof. The roof was, was, uh, it was, it was bad repair, the, the, the structure under the roof, the, the rafters and so on were dried out, and, and we made a decision right up front, we can't save everything. We'll save as much as we can, especially the exterior, <coughs> as much you know, interior as we can. But you know how old boards get split and so on, we couldn't afford it labor to, to go and try to save every bit. 
And, that, and, and when we reconstructed it, it wasn't, there's some minor changes on the inside that I think made it a little bit more user friendly, meaning people coming through, seeing different things. Okay. Here we, there's your the outhouse right there. <laughs> so we do have that. Uh, make sure that was we that get that from, done. Was that from the train station? Yeah, that was at the train station. Yeah, that was at the train station. Like I said, when the guy Morell bought the 1940, that was his plumbing there. <laughs> Just saying, it's, but what does it mean? Just saying that set where CVS and probably inside where the CVS building is. Okay, this is back up to the. No, this is back. Tear it down. The old. Finally, get we rented these walls and call them to lift up the stuff and put it in the trucks. Okay. <coughs> All right, there. The trucks are back up to the fairgrounds now, and we just we unloaded. <coughs> the, uh, like I said, we just, just a couple of those big trucks full of, full of stuff and, and the bigger panels. We panelize as much as we can. You can see here. There's a bay, like the bay window in the in the front. That was put on the ground. We covered it up with tarps. This was uh, this was right after the fair, fair in 2014. Okay. And here, here we start the reconstruction project. There's the front of it. Uh, door, two doors, door, two doorways here. And then the bay, which I said before, is here. The same machinery. There's a little bit more coming along here. Um, all reinforced. Now the roof. The roof is changed. The original roof was kind of flat, just a minimal pitch to it. And Bernie Rudberg, the, the most noted railroad historian in Dutchess County, said that the original roofs on these, all these train stations were made of slate. And the reason they're made of slate is so they wouldn't catch on fire from the coal engines kicking the sparks out. Yeah, so anyway, so anyway, we. We said we're going to make something a little different, so we put this hip roof on here, and uh, then we and you can see the, the trusses here. Here's here it's covered with uh, uh, sheathing, type of sheathing, and then we put galvanized uh, galvanized metal on top of that. So things are getting. You can notice that the core bells are gone. These, these trusses underneath are not there yet, but I think. I think that any of you see that train station today will say it's a really turned out great roof is a flat flat roof buildings are not really pretty. You know, to be honest with you from an architectural point of view. You know, cities and so on have that, but okay. Here we go. Here's another view from the from the side. You got it pretty well up. It looks like there's some plastic over the windows. The windows we took to the shop, which is down this way. And we, because a lot of the, the, like I said, the panes were bad, we had to take them all out, re putty them, paint them, did that, our, our fair crew did that during the winter. Now, this is what I wanted to point out. These we call corbels, I call a corbel, which is a brace that comes underneath the roof like that. You see how fancy you see the architecture of those? And this picture is taken down in Bob Beckman's shop. Bob Beckman has a car, like I said, Matt's auto body. And, and he has a paint shop, and he took, like I say, he took great, like Rudy Zaki, that other guy I was talking about, took great interest in doing this and took every one of those down, took all the paint off every one of them, put wood, wood filler in each one, because they are an architectural, that's the roof, and those things really add to the architecture of the building. Just got to give complete credit to, credit to, to Bob Beckman on this. Now, people want to say, well, I did this, Dick, you did this, you did that. Well, I didn't. I, other people did. <laughs> I made sure it got done. But it got, uh, they did. Okay. All right, now here you go. Here's the, here they are being painted down in his shop. See the car here? They're all painted in colors. And here they are being attached to the building. And we put bigger uh, fascia boards. You know, we had, there was some little committee. Uh, uh, disagreements on different things about the building, <coughs> and Harry, I was talking to you about that. And one of the things was this this big fascia board and the and the crown molding that goes on there. You know, the original was much narrower and a little moldy about that thing. I said, no, we're going to make it 
David, that's one of those things. My wife's a big proponent of crown moldings, right, lovey? <laughs> so, but anyway, you can see that this was, so you can see how they add to it. And these things are masterpieces, these graces, whatever you want to call them. Okay. All right, here's inside. Like I say, we, we, here's the, this is a truss from the roof trusses, so we, we just, uh, rather than lower the, lower the roof down, see, right here is, is the top of, of the interior wall. That would have been, the original ceiling would have been on top of that. We raised it up to, I was probably about that high. And part of the thinking was that we could put a shelf on top of this wall and put stuff on top of the trunks or things, things that are, that we could fasten down to add interest to the, to the thing. So it's, and over here is the, this is one of, the, one of the things that we, I want to point out, of course this is the original with the door. Now here's what the, the, the wainscoting type of, of, of material that we use in the, in the building. We could not save enough from the old building to do both rooms. So my wife, enter my wife, she said, don't try to mix and match. You know, don't put one old board and one new board and try to make it all look good. They're all new in one room, and we did have enough in the old to do the other room. So that's the way it ended up. So people don't really see that difference, and we couldn't do it any other way. It came out. Uh, Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, well that's a, another kind of the same thing. This is an interior door, this is an outside door. You walk in the building and then you go through a hallway and then there's a, there's a baggage room here and an office over here. The office where that bay window is. This is the floor. Okay, that's the front door. And there's some of the old so here's, here was the new side of the We did say it enough. Okay. Uh, kind of more of the same. This would be how you can see the construction, the Pope's and Dean construction. We, kept, we, we, we saved as many beams as we possibly could. The main beam on the top we had to replace. Um, over here, we say we're starting with wiring and so on and so forth. Yeah, okay. I wanted to say that's Richard Keith Wager who just did a fantastic job of, of uh, seeing that thing through. Uh, <coughs> uh, that so here is the side. Can you go back to that one? If, if you can't, sorry, I can do it here. Okay. The, the one interesting thing, the, the bay window in the front here. This is this is taking out the office is right here desk is here, the typewriter and so on, safe. But the reason is for the bay window is so that the station master can stand here and look out the window and see the train coming down the track. And so that it's that protruded out from the building. And that's the reason for those bays and those in that situation. And the, the reason I was I was very instrumental in in um, selecting the site for the station. And if you're at the station standing out in the front, there's the roadway that goes all the way down in front of the shop. It's a straight, it's a straight area. It looks like a place where a railroad might have been. And if you put the, you put the building back against the woods or something like that, you can say, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So it worked out very well. Okay. Right near the end. That's kind of more of the same. So we had blue. Interesting about the colors. The outside. Uh, well, you'll see the inside color how it ended up. But the outside was a uh, uh, terrible, terrible orange or color. I have other words for it. I won't tell you right here. <laughs> Mary, I think knows what I'm talking about. Had to do with cabs. And uh, anyway, so it was ghastly color. So one of the one of the little problems we had into that I said no. I, I said if I'm going to do the pro main uh, charge of this project. We're going to paint the outside a different color, not that. So yeah. I did win out on that. And we found 
we did, when all my door frames and things were piled in a heap, I went through them and found that that had been painted different colors over the years. It was not always that color. It was, it was, it was white or ivory at one time. I, and here I took a, took a piece, I said, here it is, and I can't argue with it. So I've got my way on that. Okay, again, more, kind of more of the same inside, coming together. Um, we did end up using a, a, a uh, white, oak, white oak or yellow oak, Harry, what is with it? The, <coughs> side, the I, floor, I, the floor. White oak or, or yellow oak, but we, we got that up at Pine Plains and that turned out really nice. This, the, the, you know, just an interesting, uh, interesting, this is what our budget was when we, when we came up for all this stuff, put all, all these things together, it adds up to, you know, what's a, what is a fantastic amount of, amount of money. Of course, there was some other stuff in here for the walkway and, of course, landscaping, which you got to have. And, uh, again, I want to, uh, I want to say to you that who do you think stepped up to the plate and financed a lot of this? One guess. You got Dyson. He took it. He, he thought it was like his personal property. I mean, he, he, uh, he uh, I don't know if I talk, think I went and talked to him. Sure, yeah, sure. Send him a, send him a request. Of course, this was a Dyson Foundation. Moving in Pleasant Valley was a Dyson family. As a matter of fact, I think it was Emily Dyson who did that. But he was, he and the, and the Dyson Foundation have just been overwhelmingly supportive of that thing. And like I say, their family, and I got another little cute story here, I'm almost done. The, um, <laughs> it was down at the Pleasant Valley, like I said, at the, at the school. So Rob's telling me this. He says, Dick, you know what happened? I said, what? He said, my son Chris just, just come in. He said, they tore the train station down. It's gone. From <laughs> 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 Pleasant Valley, he took it down to school. He lived right around the corner. Dad, it's gone. <laughs> and I think Ralph played around. Oh, really? It's gone? You know? <laughs> yes, Dad. <laughs> they tore the station down. It's gone. And Ralph finally said, no, the fair took it. And it, it's, up to the, it's up at the fairgrounds, so it's in good hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're getting about to the end. Oh, there's a couple of old, old engines that, that typically went a little heavy for the That's a question. Pleasant Valley. Excuse me? That's a question I wanted to ask. Where were those uh, manufacturers that were building the Poughkeepsie? Some were manufactured in Poughkeepsie. There was a Poughkeepsie locomotive works. Probably this one probably was a... Alco, it might have been Schenectady. There was a lot of locomotive. Lima, Lima locomotive works, Alco. There was a back of Schatz Federal Baron in there. Shea Baldwin's, what's that? It was in back of Schatz Federal Baron. Yeah. The old Fiat yeah. automotive factor, too. I don't think this this engine is not one that would go to Pleasant Valley. This got six drivers. See these big. This one, two, three, the three on the other side, the six drive wheels. The, the, the engines that would come through here and Pleasant Valley would have four. They'd be different, lighter engines. Okay. Yeah, so we're, yeah, there we go. Thanks to the Dyson Foundation. Okay. Is that it? Very nice. That's, uh, yeah, well, this is not the first, we're not back to that first one again, are we? No. No, oh, this was different. This is how, this, this is how, like, uh, it looks again. This was just an artist rendition. We do have a picture. We have a picture. Okay, go ahead to the next one. I got another, one more story, then I'm done. Um, okay, there's the Agriculture Museum there. That's the big building. And these are just some. Here we are done. Now this this is this is us looking from the back. Before we were looking up from the other side, and this is this is when we walked down the back of the the uh, historical building. Are those the uh, uh, train uh, street lights? They are patterned after that. We picked them out and tried to make them as as uh, apropos as possible. We we searched through a lot of different 
of magazines and books and everything else. So we try to get that feeling, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here we go. This is the opening on uh, opening at the fair. I was the uh, I was the uh, yeah. on that, and I gave a little speech on that. And thanked everybody and welcomed people and, and all the different things that go along with the grand opening. But it was a uh, you can see that, like I said, the, the color that we ended up with was a little it's like a greenish, yellowish, white, or something like that. This is Dieter Friedrichs, and this is the other fellow that got the idea of opening it. He's a railroad historian from Salt Point. He was he was there, and he and he helped all during the week to the to the. Okay, here we go. This thing tonight looks it's so unbelievable. We, again, we found. I, I got to say, Lovey, my wife, she was so unbelievable in getting all this stuff. I mean, we've traveled all over. Like, daughter went to Boston to get an old safe. I went up in Fort Ticonderoga and got uh, uh, shelves, uh, you know, uh, shelves for inside, everything. Where did you collect most of your dairy display from? In our cellar. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's got a two, uh, two, four, two, and got four drive wheels, not six. These are lighter engines. This, that's a wooden model that was given that a friend of mine that lives up in Malone, New York, found at a yard sale. Wow. That's a G-scale model thing. It's handmade, and it's exactly typical of what type of train came through there. We had, now, and then we got a hold of it, and then, we, my wife, we, 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 it was on a bigger, like a stand. We took it off that and put a track on, on the, we had bought, we bought this Lucite case for it. And then my wife got all these are G-Stale figures. These are European figures made by a company over there. Very, very detailed and beautiful figures. And so we put that all together and that's, that's at the fairground sitting up on a, you know, it's about, I'd say about that long, the whole thing. But that is that's a piece of work. You got you folks have gotta get over there next year and see this. Okay. There's right, here's that what is right here is that's what's on the wall. And it's just you know, I got kind of renewed uh, confidence in people that come in there and they think everybody's terrible. I do. I, I don't mean that. There's so many bad things in the world. And I, uh, people would come in, younger people, and they were, you know, people in their 20s, very interested in this stuff. I mean, sincerely interested. They really want to know about it. It wasn't just you know, come with their child, look at that, look at that, and wow. They were very, very, very interested in it. So it worked out. Yeah, and this, these are things that Donna did. My daughter, the pictures she got out of a book, and reproduced them and put them on a different thing. Okay. Sorry. Can't be too much. Is that it? Oh, now this is the yeah. This this is another amazing thing. This is a gazebo slash judging stand, judges stand that came from the original fairgrounds in Washington Hall. That was that was purchased by a guy over in Salt Point from when they dismantled the, the, the fairgrounds in, in the early 60s. It was on his property, thanks to a guy called Kevin Halton, who some of you might know, he's a construction guy over in mm -hmm. corners. He lived near there, and we, the fair, bought it from this fellow, and we had that relocated at the fair this year. It's completely taken apart, again, like, like Bob Beckman did with the, uh, Right. Trusses on that other building was completely put back together. So that, so we selected a spot right there. Some people wanted it down back over here. 
I said, I don't think so. So I, I was a politic and politic, and I got enough people to say, we're going to put it right here. So now you come out of the track. There's a road right here. You come out of the track. It's sitting right there. So you got the school here, train station there, and that right there. And this year, we're going to try to get a like a Dixieland band. Anybody you know say Dixieland band, let me know. That's what I want to get in there. So, in the flag, got the, got the New York State flag. Okay, I think that's probably it. <laughs> All right, this is me. This is this is old Mr. Bernie Woodberg, my right, our buddy, and he just uh, he is the most well known and, and uh, railroad historian in in Dutchess County, and he's the curator and the boss of the uh, Old Junction uh, Railroad Restoration. And this is yeah, Peter Friedman. So, Harry, do you know who this Harry? Do you know who this guy is? He, he looks familiar to me, and I can't. I can't. Yeah, I agree with you. No, I, I, I don't know who he is, but he's another guy that's, excuse me, person who is interested in, in the, this railroad people are fanatics. Maybe he's in the Hopewell Junction. I think he is. So these people were all, all so involved with this. That's got to be it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's, a, here's the thing we were talking about before. This is the case I went up to Ticonderoga to get. There's another, oh, oh night, one more story. That's, that's the opening day. Here's the board of directors. We're all lined up here. Yeah. Okay. Ah, now, this is, a, my wife made this. This is an end scale model of the Pleasant Valley. That's part of it. It goes along. It's, it's, N scale, you know, G scale is that big, N scale is like you hardly see it. So my wife did all of this, putting all this stuff together. I want to do that way. Yeah. 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 You got to, in order to appreciate that, you got to get up and see that. It's just, that's unbelievable. Okay. All right, this, this is my, all right, last promise. It was out of our basement, Allison. All right, this is my last story. That thing, that thing is called a velocity. <laughs> Now we look for a what do you call a hand cart, yeah. and you know what they'll do. You know, people get on and they, you see them now. We couldn't find a hand cart. Thanks to a friend of mine up in Chautauqua County, he was uh, involved with a museum. And I was asking him about it. He says, I think we got one of those things up there. And uh, <coughs> I said, well, he didn't find out. So come to find out, it wasn't a hand cart, but it was this, which is a similar thing to a hand cart. It's not a two-man thing. This is a one-man one man apparatus. Now, an interesting thing about this is that this was made, uh, I'm not sure it was up in Chautauqua County. I don't know where it was. It doesn't make any difference where it was. The guy worked for the railroad. He lived about a mile away from the station. He got tired of walking a mile working. <laughs> he says, well, there's tracks out here. I've got to figure out a way get to the my house to the station. <laughs> so he invented this thing. But you can see it's got three wheels. It's got it's got uh, pedals on it. There's pedals there. You can pedal it like a bike. You can pull this thing back and forth and to make it go. And and you see a wooden seat, just a wooden seat. And stuff to put his lunch box and stuff in there. <laughs> but anyway, he started he made one of these things and wherever it was, he used it. The officials from the railroad, whatever railroad it was, I don't know, they, they came along and said, where'd you get that thing? He <laughs> says, that's exactly what we need to work on the track. You know, instead of guys walking or riding a horse down the track, we need something like that. So that convention ultimately <coughs> became a prototype, whether well, that's exactly the one, I don't know, there's one just like it. In a prototype of a company in Kalamazoo, Michigan, called Kalamazoo Philosophy. <laughs> so that was, that drew a great deal of interest, and in, you know, of course, it's almost in now. We're talking to people about it. We sent it back. We had to send it back to the museum. And Harry Baldwin. I want to thank Harry Baldwin right there. who was a guy who went up to, to get it, and he, we appreciate that. He went up with his. Snowmobile trailer. Put, Harry said, well, went up on the snowmobile trailer. Yeah. So we loaded the whole thing on. 
Yeah, yeah. Harry kept calling me. He says, how big is it? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about taking the cattle trailer. And then we, I said, I don't think you need that. So it fit right in there, right? Did nice in there. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we appreciate that. You know, yeah, that's 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 but yeah, the outrigger comes off, so actually it looks like a motorcycle with a side car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's so, but that's the that's fascinating thing. Okay. Okay, yeah, there we go. Let's see. All right. Thank you. Uh, school from uh, Mount Ross in uh, Pine Plains. I think this is a fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ingrid, Ingrid took that at night, shows the gazebo with that. I mean, that's just how the site that picture. Okay. There you go. <laughs> There's a train station in Dover Plains that became the bagel shop, and now it's falling apart. And it's the same period. Who who owns that? Is it is it owned by the train people or the town of Dover or? I think probably Metro North people. I know I know I used to go get bagels. I know it's the same architectural style. Yeah, they just built the station with just a landing the platform with a high platform. So it is in a state of disrepair. As a matter of fact, I was by there the other day. So it's, it's a typical of something that Dover people got to do what all of Doty did down there. Get a bunch of people, come to a meeting like this, say, folks, we've got this thing falling apart. You know, hold, hold your head out, go to Dyson, go to whoever. Try to save it. they got to do that in Pleasant Valley. As soon as it falls apart or it's vandalized, then people will start the railroad's not going to fix it. We still have our freight yeah. station. We have train, the freight station. Our train station is gone, but the freight station is still back behind what? Quiet House. Behind, yeah, Johnny Miller has the board yeah. track. It's the warehouse. Yeah. Yeah. You might they mention it's the oldest surviving station. Oh, yeah. Which one? Pleasant Valley. Yeah, it's the only the Pleasant Valley. It's the only surviving station on the P&E line. <clears throat> but it's the oldest station existing, the one in, in Fishkill, which you hear a Fishkill lot about. Is, burned, it's several yeah. years younger, and most of it burned. It was set on fire, I guess, mm -hmm. was it whatever set on fire. So they lost a lot of it. So oh, all of that is all original now. And uh, they did leave a spot in one of the doors where it was charred, just like, like charcoal. And they sanded the rest of it down and saved it, and then they have a line across it and see it on the door. But, what the fire did to the people. Any other questions? I wonder how old the one in Dover Plains is. Well, like I said, it was 1848. It, was, 1848. I, I don't know whether that was the original station. It could have been 1848. That was the first train that came to Dutchess County. Did it come up all the way to Wasaic? No, to the Dover. Factor? Dover Plains. It, just, it ended right in Dover. Dover Plains. What? Oh, milk was a very important thing. Oh, yeah. The, all the railroads were involved with milk. And, and it was one of the other things, it was a big uh, processing, Warden had a processing plant in, in uh, Wasaic and in Salt Point. There was three or four milk processing plants. It was one in Millbrook, right down where... The, the one in the Burbank and one in Billings. Billings. I have one more question. Excuse me. Um, do you think, I'm going to call it your open air museum, with all these great pieces that you've collected at the Duchess, Fair, Fair, Duchess Fairgrounds? No. Are you finished, or are you still looking for more pieces to add to the picture, or are you thinking it's the project no. You finished? say open air museum, what is it? Well, in section? Denmark they save old buildings, <coughs> and oh. it's a museum that's outside, so it's called open air museum. You don't have a roof over everything. <coughs> So you're under the sky looking at... Aren't we looking for that type of building? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm asking, have you finished? Are you not going to have any more buildings? Oh, yes, we want to... That, that, whole, that whole area beyond the, where the train station is and over to the, the maintenance buildings, we envision as a historical village. 
We got so sapped out, sapped out with this particular thing, I'm reluctant. I'm re I am reluctant, although I'm the one that started, to say anything. I've got to lay low for a couple of years. But yes, we are. We want to have a bank. We want to have a feed store. We want to have a firehouse. Church. Uh, hotel. Stuff like that. Yes, the answer is yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was wondering uh, how old that collection of milk bottles is and whether you're still collecting them. You're talking to the wrong person, but my wife is in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. She we knows. tried to find bottles that were native bottles, different places, Wapiger's Falls and different areas of the county. And I can't tell you how many we have so far. Um, we have a Millbrook bottle, Fraley Farm, what have you. And, and uh, different different ones that we could find. It, the search is unbelievable. I must how tell old, you. How old? <coughs> how old are the bottles? Yeah. They would they would not have been the original ones probably because the bottles, milk bottles, in um, 1870. You know, they're that's around the time that they were starting putting um, milk in bottles. Well, the first milk bottles were actually not glass. They were a pottery type of thing, uh, uh -huh. stone made. Uh, yeah, well, my, my father had Brooklands Farm in the town of Poughkeepsie, five miles south of Poughkeepsie. And uh, uh, I, I know one family member who has a, a Brooklands milk bottle, but I don't know if I If you'd like to have it displayed at the fair, that's wonderful. We have several Poughkeepsie milk bottles. Bottles. Oh, you already do. We did not, not like particularly that one. There were a lot of places that yeah. farms that had bottles um, in the years, and that that yeah, whatever we can get to put together to make make a grouping of all the different ones in the county like that. So, uh, so are there any more questions? All milk bottles are very rare. The act, the life of a milk bottle, a glass milk bottle, was eight trips. And that's the reason why we went to bulk milk hauling and the cartons. And so therefore, there are not a lot of old milk bottles. Uh, uh, DeMartine, Kevin DeMartine has some. And I've asked him to submit them to or uh, contribute them to the uh, Historic Society, and he refuses to. It's a tight <laughs> 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 but, but that's not true. We were, in, in the 1950s, you only called the milk bottle. That was the death of the last milk bottle. But there are a lot of them around that are in attics and cellars that are uh, very valuable. Now, I saw one, I found one in a, in, a, in a dump pile behind a barn that was advertising a Lone Ranger. So that was a recent one, and it was full color and all of that stuff. But that was the last one that I had. Okay, one There's the bottle shop, and I've been to the bottle shop. You know where the bottle shop is? Yes. That's yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. And I got the Nyagrin uh, bottle. Is that the one? Spike Nyagrin. Nyagrin. Oh. They had a milk company. Sure. And I'm on the, I'm, I have the house that they had. Oh, oh okay. So I got the bottle oh, huh? and I put the bottle on the mantle to say that goes That's with the house. Beautiful. <laughs> well, the first bottle, but you're right, they're expensive. I mean, it's like buying wine. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.